Well, good morning to you. It's my privilege to welcome you to Central Presbyterian Church today, where we seek transformation through the renewing work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope, our desire is to be different people, to be a changed people by the work of Jesus and Jesus alone. And we're studying about how that change works into our lives and adds us into a new family, a new kingdom of God as we study the book of 1 Peter together. Last week, we saw that since we belong to our Heavenly Father in this new family, we are called to be holy. It's a family resemblance that we are called to have. Because our Heavenly Father is holy, we walk in holiness. And today, the Apostle Peter presses that truth deeper into our hearts. As a family belonging to our Heavenly Father, what does it look like for us to walk in holiness together as the people of God together? We're going to study together 1 Peter 1 verse 22 through chapter 2 verse 3. That's on page 1014 in your pew Bibles. If you'd like to follow along using that Bible, let me pray as we turn our hearts to God's Word. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would send your spirit and open our eyes that we might behold Jesus. Open our ears to hear the call of the beautiful music of the gospel and renew our wills and make us followers of Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 22. Hear God's word. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for this pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is the living and abiding Word of God. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Do you know what this is? It's a little small. Maybe some of you in the back can't see it very well. These are those Russian nesting dolls. You've seen those before? You know how they work. There's a larger doll, and then when you take the top off, there's a smaller doll, and then you take the top off of that one, there's a smaller yet inside that. The child dolls on the inside are cocooned, enveloped, and wrapped in the context of this safe outer mother doll. And that's a little bit like what the Apostle Peter uses to describe the truths of our redemption this morning. This is how it goes. What is true precedes what to do. And the order is never reversed in the Scriptures. What is true leads us to what to do in response. In other words, you can't get to what to do living a life of holiness and obedience without dealing with the outside context of the promises of redemption, the promises that God has given to save us. Unless we are wrapped in and motivated by the promises of our salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, if we don't grab that... We have no hope of living lives of holiness, no hope of loving one another as God's people. The promises that God makes to us as His children are opened up, and inside those promises of God, we find the ability, we find the strength, we find God's energy to obey Him. Put another way, gospel declarations precede gospel obligations, always in the Bible. Specifically in this passage, Peter is calling us to live lives of loving one another sincerely from the heart, earnestly loving one another as God's people. And you can't get to that kind of behavior as a child of God without being enveloped and wrapped about in the love of God of the gospel. What is true leads to what to do. 
And it's really important to keep that order straight if you don't want to lose hope when things get hard. And believe me, loving one another is hard. So this morning, what we're going to do is start by studying why. Why do we love one another from these scriptures? And what are we called to do in response? So let's start with first, the why. Why are we called to love one another? Look at verse 22. Peter begins with, having purified your souls, love one another. And then in verse 23, since you have been born again, put away all malice and envy, love one another, in other words. And when you look at the original in the Greek, there's a causal relationship in verses 22 and 23. We could translate it, because you have been purified, love one another. And because you have been born again, put away all malice from one another. So in a sense, Peter is giving us the reasons why we are to love one another. The first reason, he tells us, is because our souls have been purified by obedience to the truth. What does that mean? What does that mean to be, have obedience to the truth? Well, if you see that phrase numerous times in the New Testament, it means believe the gospel. Obedience to the truth means to embrace and believe the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. It's used numerous times in the New Testament. Just one example for you this morning. In Galatians 5, verse 7, you remember that Paul was writing to Christians in Galatia who who were being uh, tricked into thinking that they could obey themselves into right relationship with God. But Paul says in verse 7, who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? He's not talking about some command that they would have mastered. We, we aren't now so obedient that we could become pure. It's impossible. You can't be good enough to be pure in God's eyes. It's not possible, but rather here and there, obey the truth means obey the gospel. It means embrace that truth of what God has done, that fact of the Redeemer having come for us in Christ. When we talk about obeying the gospel, the the fullness of that is that God has declared victory over sin and evil and even death itself. He has ascended to be the crucified king, the lamb of God who gave his life and who now reigns over us and reigns for us. That report of what God has done is the gospel that is proclaimed, that's announced to all the world, and we are called to obey, to believe it, to surrender, to kneel at the Lord in his presence as our king. Specifically in verse 25, having purified is a perfect participle. Now, for all of you grammarians out there, a perfect participle is something happened in the past but has continuing effect in your life. So what Peter is saying is you have already been purified by obeying the gospel, by bowing the knee and surrendering to Jesus. He has made you pure, and yet that work has ongoing effect into your future, into the way that you live your life. When we have believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that same power of God is at work to transform us in an ongoing fashion so that we love one another, that we walk in love as the people of God. This gospel truth comes from the Word of God, the living and abiding Word. And as chapter 2, verse 2 says, we crave it like newborns crave spiritual milk. How do newborns crave? They cry out, right? They can't be satisfied unless they have it. We've heard some of our youngest disciples this morning crying out. Do you cry out for God's Word in your life? Do you cry out like a a newborn who can't be satisfied unless you have this milk? Is that your relationship with the Word of God that you might be strengthened to obey the gospel, to believe and bow the knee to the Lord who is King? We love one another first because the gospel is at work in our lives. But he gives us a second reason why. Verse 23 Since you have been born again, you've been regenerated by the Spirit of God, we are given that gift of new life. So since we have been born again, we put away all malice and slander. We love one another, in other words. 
That quality of the life that God has given us by the power of the Spirit isn't like frail, faulty human life. The life God places within us as his people is one of imperishable seed. It is the, a life that endures, a life that never fails. We, we are born again by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit who works by and with his living and abiding word. That life in you by the Spirit of God is permanent. It's enduring It can't be robbed by other human powers. It can't be undone by some pressure in your life. God's promise of life given to his people is a promise that lasts forever. Do you know that power of God's forever promise in your life this morning? Peter speaks to it in verses 24 and 25 in quoting Isaiah 40. His point is that God's word is permanent God's word is eternal. It endures forever, unlike the human word, human authority, human power, which is like flowers that fade and fall. All human power is fleeting at best, like a flowering grass that might be splendid for a moment, but dies after a very short season. We've come to one of uh, my wife Missy's favorite seasons of the year, and that is the season when the peonies bloom. Beautiful flowers. They're lush, and especially this year with all the rain that we've had recently, the peonies are fat and lush and beautiful. They smell terrific, and yet all that beauty, all that lush beauty, and yet peonies are delicate. They're going to be gone soon. They're splendid for a moment, and and then they're gone. And Peter is saying, human power, human word, human authority is like those peonies. It, it, It withers and it falls, and you can't build your life on human words. You build your life on God's word and God's power, which does not fail. It stands, it lasts, it remains forever, and it's that power of God planted in you that brings you and me from death to life. But the people to whom Peter originally wrote were under threat by human power. Remember, these were Christians who had been scattered from their home in Rome. They were kicked out. They lost their wealth. They lost their possessions. They had to, had to move. They had to move to the outer edges of the Roman Empire, going with nothing. They were threatened by the power of an empire. But Peter is saying, though all the glitter and all the pomp and all the fearsome power of Rome might be astounding, but it will fall and wither. The peer pressure that we face in our life will wither. It is nothing compared to the power of the Word of God alive within you and me. As He strengthens us to live for Him, strengthening us to love one another even when it's hard, there is a power that God gives us to follow after him when we are under pressure, when we are persecuted, when we are accused. And that power, that life, is the only life-giving power in this world. I think it's fitting today that our friend Jamal is here with us from Iraq. You're going to hear from him in just a few moments about all that God is doing in and through their ministry in Iraq. They proclaim the gospel. They preach the gospel. They serve others in word and in deed. And men and women and children are coming to Jesus in the face of terrible pressure from their own nation, from surrounding nations. They're coming to visit Jamal to study the Bible across borders under the threat of persecution, under the threat of their families being persecuted, they're coming and we see pictures of them being baptized, coming to know Jesus out of all of this pressure and all of this, this terror in their lives. Who can do that in the face of such persecution? Who has the power to turn aside from the, the family and their, their families being persecuted, the, the threats against them? Who has the power to do that? Peter gives us the answer. 
It's the person who believes that the power of the nations will fall like grass. Empires will fail like flowers that fade. The empire of Iraq, of Iran, even of America, it will fall. But the life that God gives to us will never fall, will never fade. It lasts forever. And that word of God is the only safe word upon which to build your life. The only safe word to build your life and know that it will not fade. It will not fa- uh, fail me. His promises will last forever. It's that promise of the word of God that God plants in our hearts as an imperishable seed. It grows and we begin to live under the conviction that no one can take it away. No one can pressure me. No one can threaten me. No one can threaten me with disapproval or harm with such a power that God can't overcome it. Whatever hardship you face, whatever pressure you face, whatever you feel the peer pressure in your life forcing you to be or become or say or embrace something that the Word of God tells you not to, all of that pressure will fall away. It will fade. But the living and abiding Word of God shall not. In Iraq and in the United States of America as well. All around the world, the power of God is at work through his word. It's the same power that's planted in you and me, the power of God's promise that builds us up to grow us up into holiness. Why do we love one another? Peter gives us two answers. Because in the gospel, God is at work, and we have been born again placed in a new family by a power of God that shall not be thwarted. So what do we do in response? If that's the why, what do we do in response? Remember the doll? That's the the outside, the promises. When we open up the promises of God that tell us we're born again, that the gospel is at work, we're deeply loved by a God who's paid for all of our sin and Jesus crucified for us. When we open up those promises, we find a call and a strength to love one another as children of God. Look at verse 22. Someone obeys the gospel, embraces God's love for us in Christ. He produces within us an earnest love for the brothers from the heart. God is the one who plants that within us. God is the one who enables us. And so, therefore, chapter 2, verse 1, put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy, and all slander. Put all of those things away because God has planted a life and a love within you as his child. Can you recognize that that string of things Peter mentions are all about striving to protect yourself? Malice, and deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and slander, it's all about protecting myself which is contrary to the heart of God, the kind of love that God has for us, which is not a self-protecting love, but a self-giving love. He's given of of his own son in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us in his grace. He doesn't have a self-protecting love. He has a self-giving love, and he calls you and me to have that same kind of posture toward believers in the family of God. Malice, you might know as the word that's used for holding a grudge and nursing that grudge. Now, it seems that grudge is the fuel that runs our world right now. It's all over social media. It's, you just open up Twitter and all you see is grudge after grudge after grudge after grudge, but it is not to be so among the people of God. That we don't hold grudges. We don't nurse Grudges against one another, that's malice. Deceit, and deceit leads us to hypocrisy because sometimes we even deceive ourselves. And we're not living in the way that we profess with our lips to follow after the Lord. Envy craves what someone else has, and I'm willing to rob the happiness of another so that I can have the object of my desire. It's envy. And sometimes feeling envious, we slander someone. We shade the truth with a little bit of falsehood so that someone is, is, is covered with a shadow. It's just a shadow cast over their person, just a, a seed of suspicion that's counted about someone else. Friends, so many blogs that we read 
are all about slander. I know this is what they said, but what they really mean is it's true in the world. It's also true of Christian discernment blogs. So many of them are just trafficking in slander. I know this is what this person says, but they don't believe it. You should believe this other thing instead. You can't trust them. It is not to be so among the people of God. We are called to sincerely love one another from the heart. When you add all of those things together, it boils down to living for and protecting self rather than giving of self to serve and love someone else. And the world is thirsty for that kind of love. A kind of love that seeks to give self away to build up and serve another person. Our society is thirsty for that kind of love because we are awash in a relational crisis. There's an epidemic of loneliness in our world these days. David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, uh, who is a new Christian, by the way. You may not know that. David Brooks committed his life to Christ a little bit over a year ago as a follower of Jesus these days, and he has just written a new book. It's titled, How to Know a Person. And it illustrates what does it look like to engage someone in relationship and actually get to know them. Just some statistics about loneliness in our world from chapter 8 in that book. Between 1990 and 2020, the number of adults in America who said they had no close friends quadrupled. From 1990 to 2020, four times as many people said they have no close friends. It's a crisis of loneliness. A recent survey from 2022 reported 54% of American adults say no one knows them well. Not a person. 36% report being lonely frequently or all the time, including 61% of young adults. We're living in a crisis of loneliness in our world. In 2013, an average adult reported spending six and a half hours a week with friends. By 2019, it was down to four hours a week. In 2021, coming out of COVID, it was down to two hours and 45 minutes a week with friends. That's a 53% decline in time spent with friends. We are living in a crisis of connection, in a a lonely century, a world awash in this loneliness. We need to be loved inside relationships, and it seems like that's one of the things human beings are most terrible at. And yet God sets us in a new family. He takes us from that loneliness, takes us from that isolation, and sets us inside a new family, having been born again by the promise of his word. And we open up those promises and we find a new family. People to whom we are called to love and to serve in a new family. And each one of us needs a family, needs the family of God, increasingly so in this world of loneliness. And let me just say to All those who are watching online this morning, please come back. If you're able, if if you're not at risk, please come back and see face-to-face the family of God who loves you and misses you. We need to be together. We need to be nourished in relationships as the people of God. We do it as we sit side-by-side, face-to-face with the family of God. We created for it. We're created for love one for another among the people of God. What does that look like? Let's give us a few examples this morning of what it looks like to love in the people of God. It means, first of all, that we don't give up on each other very easily. Who are you tempted to give up on right now? If we are born again, By an imperishable seed, the word planted within us, giving us new life, taken from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. If that has happened in our lives, we don't give up easily on one another because Jesus doesn't give up on you. Who are you tempted to give up on today? Another thing it means as we love one another in the people of God, it means to stay connected with each other, connected in Jesus This year when it's a polarized and polarizing time, when we are being ripped apart, 
And everyone, everything will tell you it's not possible to stay connected in love to people with whom you disagree politically. You're going to hear that many times over the coming months. But the Bible says it's not true. We can remain connected in Jesus even when we have differences from one another. Think about Jesus' as 12. This little merry band of disciples, they came from different backgrounds and had different political commitments. One of them was Simon the Zealot. You may not know, but Zealot was a political party. It was a party committed to the violent overthrow of Rome to get them out of Judea. One of Jesus' 12 was a Zealot. Another one of Jesus' 12 was Matthew, the tax collector who was seeking to raise money, get taxes from his fellow Jews to pay money to the Romans who were occupying Judea. These guys were as opposite as you could get. One was committed to violently overthrowing this Roman authority, and the other was committed to propping it up by getting taxes from Jews, and yet they remained together in this merry band of 12. How? Why? Because they chose to focus on what brought them together, and it's Jesus. Jesus brought them together. Jesus can bring us together in the family of God, even when we have political differences, ethnic differences, all kinds of differences in our world. Loving one another means loving one another across some of these differences. It also means that we stick with each other in our hours of need. Sometimes, The need in someone's life stretches beyond the bounds of what's an inconvenience and it becomes a hardship. And yet loving one another calls us to go with them into that crossing the boundary, into a place where it's hard because Jesus didn't drop you and me when loving us was costly, when he gave his own life on the cross. We don't give up on each other easily. We don't drop one another when it's hard. We are also called in love to be patient with one another, bearing with someone when they're annoying because Jesus bears with us, bears with our repeated and habitual sins. Loving one another means a refusal to belittle one another, refusal to bully one another. Students, I especially want to encourage you to hear this. As part of the people of God, we don't use those tactics of belittling and bullying That's what many do in the world, but not among the people of God because Jesus is gracious with you and me. He's not harsh with you and me. And so rather than belittling and bullying one another, we are tender with each other. One one last hint, it looks like inviting someone who's lonely into your home. Someone who is lonely into your life, making room for them at your table, room for them in your life because Jesus has welcomed you into his loving family. All of that love for one another is fueled by God's love for us, obeying the truth, embracing the gospel that Jesus was crucified for our sins, raised from the dead in victory. He's planted life within us that is stronger than any fearful opposition. The Apostle Paul says, your life is hidden with Christ in God, hidden like God's great Russian nesting doll. You're enveloped by the promises of God and the power and life of God cannot fail, cannot fade, and that life of God is with you, with all your brothers and sisters in Christ, safe, bound together by the promises of God. Because you are loved, ask the Lord to strengthen you to love one another in response. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love, a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love. And Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us by the power of your spirit, using your word to equip us to love one another to be patient with one another, tender with one another, to bear with one another when it's hard because you have done and continue to do that with us as your children. Make us that kind of family. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.